Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Borderud, director of the Armstrong Browning Library, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our first in-person lecture in over two years. It is wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful to see your faces. Um, I'm also pleased that we are still able to connect virtually with friends across the country and around the world. Um, and I'd like to welcome those joining us via Zoom, including members of the London Browning Society and the Center for uh, 19th Century Studies International. Um, I would also like to recognize some special guests. Joining us this afternoon are members of the Library Board of Advisors, who spent the morning with Baylor's Institute for Oral History and learning design teams, and then enjoyed lunch and a business meeting here at the ABL. Thank you for being with us today, and thank you for your support of and commitment to the Baylor Libraries. I would also like to recognize, on behalf of the Baylor Libraries, Dr. Clement Goode, Professor Emeritus of English, who retired in May 1996 after teaching at Baylor for 39 years. Together with his late wife, Jane, Dr. Goode established the Clement Goode Endowment to purchase materials related to George Gordon, Lord Byron, and the reading and understanding of 18th and 19th century romantic literature. Thank you, Dr. Goode, for your ongoing contributions to Baylor through the creation of this endowment. Would you mind raising your hand so that we can see you? And now that we are on the subject of Byron, I would like to introduce you to our speaker. Mark Sandy is professor in the Department of English Studies at Durham University in the United Kingdom and the ABL's three-month research fellow. He has published extensively on romantic poetry and its legacies, including the monographs Poetics of Self and Form in Keats and Shelley and Romanticism, Memory and Mourning. He has also curated a series of edited collections on romantic echoes from the 19th century to the present day, Decadence, Venice, and most recently, The Spectral, in Ghostly Encounters, Cultural and Imaginary Representations of the Spectral from the 19th century to the present. He is currently the editor of the Review for the British Association of Romantic Studies, his latest monograph, Transatlantic Transformations of Romanticism, Aesthetics, Subjectivity, and the Environment, was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2021 and will be available in paperback later this year. He is currently co-editing a four-volume set on loss, memory, and mourning, and researching a book-length study provisionally titled Spectral Presences in Romantic and Victorian Poetry from Wordsworth to the Brownings. I first met Dr. Sandy when he held a one month visiting research fellowship at the ABL in 2017. And I learned then that he not only is a phenomenal scholar, um, but he also has an amazing family. And while I'm disappointed that his wife Hazel could not make the trip to Waco this time around, I'm happy that his son has been able to spend the semester with us. So Michael, we are really glad that you're here. Um, you all should have a handout that goes along with Dr. Sandy's lecture. For those online, the handout will be linked in the chat. Um, following his talk, Dr. Sandy will answer questions and those on Zoom can submit questions in the Q&A section uh, of the Zoom. Now, please welcome Dr. Mark Sandy. Thanks, Jennifer, for that very kind and generous um, introduction. I always feel like I'm getting imposter syndrome when I hit my CV. I think, is that really me? Um, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in a room talking with you all uh, in person. It's wonderful to be back in Baylor, back in Waco. As Jennifer said, I was here in 2017, and it's been a real treat to be back here in 2022, although much delayed for obvious reasons when the world went a little bit crazy with something called COVID. Um, I want to thank Jennifer 
Christine, uh, Laura and Carolina from the Armstrong Brown Library, they've made me feel very welcome again and they've been tremendously kind and helpful and generous with their time and helping me with the research that I've been undertaking during the time that I've been here. So I'm very grateful to them for that. I can't think of a better building really, a surprising building to find perhaps in, in central Texas, to talk about Venice. Um, it reminds me so much of one of those Venetian uh, palazzos with its wonderful iridescent stained glass windows, its bronze doors, um, of course here with the emblems of pomegranates from Robert Brown's poetry engraved upon them. Uh, and of course, uh, where we had lunch earlier on in, in the Cox reception hall, um, there is a window dedicated to Venice, a stained glass window uh, around the uh, figures and representations of the Browning's poetry, but nonetheless, depicting uh, the Rialto, the Doge's Palace, uh, the Basilica of San Marco, and of course, St. Mark's um, Square. Even in this room, the treasure room, the Armstrong Browning Library, there is a little bit of a story that connects with Venice. And the, I haven't got a picture of it, but you can have a look after my talk. Over there in the far right cabinet, on the far side of it, there is a wonderful little um, traveling tea set tea basket, English tea basket set. And the story that goes with that tea set is that uh, Mrs. Jean Sherwood, uh, uh, an American art critic, was on a train traveling from Venice uh, to Florence when uh, she was partaking of tea from her tea set and found herself traveling with a gentleman that she did not know. Um, they fell into conversation about the arts and about poetry and uh, what she didn't know was that she was talking to a very elderly Robert Browning in the summer of 1889. And he asked her before uh, his identity was revealed to her, who's your favorite American female poet? And she was at a bit of a loss to think of an American female poet that she particularly rated. But she did say, I think one of the finest poets, female poets that we have is Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Browning uh, disembarked from the train uh, at Bologna, he never went back to Florence after the death of his wife, um, but he did reveal to her his um, identity. and He was much moved by her praise um, of his deceased wife's work. I begin then with a haunting Venetian literary anecdote about the Brownings. But some nearly eight decades before that event, Baron himself found himself haunted by the city of Venice. Here, he arrives in Venice in late autumn, 1816. And on the 15th of November, let's just introduce Barn for those who are perhaps not familiar with him, but I'm sure many of you will be, here we are. The, the brooding presence of Lord Barn in one of his more sort of Manfred-like poses. And of course that famous quotation that's associated with him, that he was mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He writes this. Um, of Venice on the 15th of November, 1816, having just arrived. It's the first quotation on the handout. Venice pleases me as much as I had expected, and I expected much. It is one of those places which I know before I see them and has always haunted me the most after the East. I like the gloomy gaiety of their gondolas and the silence of their canals. I do not even dislike the evident decay of the city do we regret that the singularity of its, that its is Byron's spelling, not mine, vanished costume. However, there is much left still. I know that Byron thinks of Venice as existing before it's even known to him. It exists in and of his mind through the literary imagination. And yet it is a city that is full of wonders and delights for him and one that is already twice diminished by the time that Barna arrives there. It of course has undergone the collapse of the Venetian Republic on the 13th of May, 1797, and has subsequently been plundered by foreign uh, powers. Barna is haunted though by the possibility of Venice as an atemporal site of the imagination, and yet also haunted by the tragic reality of its historical situation. For Barna and others before him then, Shakespeare, Thomas Otway, Pierre, and for those that came after him, people like Thomas Mann, Nietzsche. Venice is an endless imagined city and an endless city of imagination. And this is certainly true of 
Barnes' representation of it in the Canto IV of Charlie Howell's Pilgrimage, where he addresses Venice as thy wreck a glory. Venice, think, Venice is thought of by Barnes as oscillating them between the Venice of the mind and the imagination and the facts of the fallen Venetian Republic. And Barnes oscillates between these two kinds of ideas of Venice to explore and speculate about how and what will survive or be remembered of Venice for posterity. This, in many senses, is the essence of my theme uh, for the rest of this talk, um, which is this idea of the muse of history's um, pen, that Byron's priority suggests then a complex relationship between biography and public record, between personal memory and public monument, between poetic artistry and the writing of history. History is both dictated as fact to the chronicler from perhaps some higher authority and creatively, subjectively, even subversely interpreted through the writing down of those inspired and inspiring facts. So it's the kind of haze between what we might think of historical reality and, and fictionalized accounts that I'm interested um, in Bond's representations of Venice, yes, um, but also other Italian um, delights um, that his mind wanders to as he um, pans across both history and time um, an artistic achievement of Italy in Canto IV. But I have a confession, which is that the first thing I'm going to talk about is not in Venice. It's the Colosseum. I have a reason. The passage I'm going to look at next is from Barnes Manfred, published in 1816. Uh, it's Barnes' lyrical drama. It was chiefly written in Switzerland, but completed in Venice. Uh, so there is a Venice connection. And I think the way that Barnes uses um, the image of the Colosseum uh, to image his central anxieties over posthumous reputation uh, through a preoccupation with ruins, with the fragments of the historical past, speaks very much to the way that Barnes goes on to treat um, Venice and her ruination in Canto IV of Child Held. In Manfred, Barn fantasizes about surviving ahistorically, beyond those recorded figures and events, which become monumentalized as public history. Manfred rarely speaks in the present tense, and when he does so, his words often quickly turn immediate experience into imagined past reflection overtaken, as Manfred puts it, by an inexplicable stillness of mood. The soliloquy, which I'm going to read to you, comes from Act Three of Manfred, uh, and it dwells on the presence of a new sense of things before being very quickly turned into something that is a past historical record, a past event, as Manfred puts it elsewhere, and within my tab tablets would note down that there is such a feeling so immediacy and presentness gets turned into past event by Manfred. Here are my favorite lines from this lyrical drama. It is Manfred reflecting upon a, a nocturnal rambling that leads him to the ruins of the Colosseum. We see uh, in, in the use of tense here, so it's not my pacemaker, that's the main thing. Um, we see here uh, him recollecting on this useful night's rambling uh, and we see him moving it verbally in tenses, but also in memory between present, past, and future. He attempts to evade historical reality and exist a temporally. So, quote two. When I was wandering upon such a night, I stood within the Colosseum's warm, midst the chief relics of almighty Rome. The trees which grew along the broken arches waved dark in the blue midnight, and the stars shone through the rents of ruin from afar, the watchdog bayed beyond the Tiber, and more near from out of the Caesar's palace came the owl's long cry and interruptedly of distant sentinels, the fitful song begun and died upon the gentle wind. Some cypresses beyond the time-worn breach appeared to skirt the horizon, yet they stood within a bowshot where the Caesar's dwelt and dwell the tuneous birds of night amidst a grove which springs through level battlements and twines its roots with the imperial hearths, ivy asserts the lowell's place of growth. 
but the gladiator's bloody circus stands, a noble wreck in ruinous perfection. I love that noble wreck in ruinous perfection. Manfred's chant's reminiscence of stumbling upon a midnight scene, enchanted by the light of celestial bodies, serves as a reminder of the disparity between the terrible reality, the numerous bloody deeds uh, of the Colosseum's past and its moonlit transformation into a graceful, tragic nobility of ruinous perfection. I suppose I have in mind here um, a rather incisive later remark of Walter Benjamin's, where he, he comments that there is no document of civilization which is not the same at the same time a document of barbarism. Manfred's retrospective is focused as much on remembering or forgetting events from the past and as on how the historical past will be remembered or forgotten in and for the future. History is the foster child of both remembrance and forgetfulness. Symbolized by the usurped Laurel's place of growth, what is vitally at stake here is the extent to which posterity will record Rome's cultural achievements or its barbarism, Manfred's prodigious feats or his unspoken transgression in the play. And behind those concerns lurks, of course, Byron's own concern for whether he will be remembered for his poetry and his great artistry or his personal indiscretions. The historical and the personal merge here. There is much at stake. Byron is perhaps thinking in part through Manfred about what is the role of aristocracy in the wake of the French Revolution. Uh, he's thinking too of the fact that Napoleon has, uh, has been liberated or escaped briefly um, from Elba. And he's also haunted by his own personal worries and anxieties um, about the scandal that's about to break um, in England over his uh, uh, affair with his half-sister, Augusta Lee. So scandalous things are afoot too. So again, the personal and the public um, are, as it were, blurring into one another here. Questions about posthumous reputation, modes of subjectivity and temporality are crucial to Barnes prolific, even insatiable writings, both in and about Venice. Venice is at once the physical haunt and mindscape of Byronic poetic creation and selfhood. Reflecting on his state of mind during the writing of Canton IV of Charlotte Howell, in a letter from Venice to Thomas More, dated the 28th of January, 1817, Byron confesses this. This is quote three. I am glad that you like the, and that's the new Charlie Howell account of four. It is a fine, indistinct piece of poetical desolation and my favorite. I was half mad during the time of composition between metaphysics, mountains, lakes, love unextinguishable, thoughts unutterable, and the nightmare of my own delinquencies. And I think that's partly about the notorious affairs that Barnum was having during his time in Venice, but also about that haunting personal scandal of the affair with Augusta Lee um, that has led him to be self-exiled from polite British society. He goes on um, to speculate how, about how he may have blown his bra brains out, but he, he thinks that would give too much satisfaction to his mother-in-law. So. Um, puts that idea on the back burner, doesn't do that. Barnes' admission that he considered himself half mad and claimed afraid that he really might be going mad echoes, of course, Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark. Um, that, that claim that he also makes in relation to Counter Three is that if I don't write to empty my mind, I go mad. So there's a real connection here about the art of writing as a means of staving off the threat of madness. It's a way of vacating the mind of its disordered and ragtag bag of thoughts that might otherwise disturb and disquiet the mind. But Barnes' statement also entwines the art of writing with a self-consciousness of poetic artistry. Barnes says here that the writing eye and the eye that might go mad offers a strangely bifurcated view of selfhood, one that is at once subjective and objectified, which constitutes a notion of the self, mad or not, as fixed, unified and stable, as well as mirrored, splintered and multiple.
An early anonymous admirer of Byron's poetry, writing a year or so after the poet's death, in a preface to Byron, Arnia, Bonzi and Piozzi's, a rather curious and interesting work, um, which imagines a series of conversations about Byron's poetry between the two protagonists of the subtitle, um, recognizes a similar set of complex and contradictory traits that define Byronic selfhood. Recalling, in fact, aspects of the letter that Bond writes to Thomas More. Uh, the author, uh, anonymous uh, as they remain, of the preface comments on Barnes' priority this, he is a bard of gigantic talents whose richly cultivated intellect, stored uh, from books and from nature, furnishes an inexhaustible supply of materials, which, like the pieces of glass in a kaleidoscope, he places in a thousand, thousand shapes to dazzle, instruct, and delight. And it should be quote for the handout, but it's there on the slide. Ah, some Turner, excellent. With our Venetian theme in mind, we might then conceive of a Byronic subjectivity that is composed and recomposed at once fractured and home, like the tasserai of a mosaic. After all, Byron's eye in the latter part of his sword, John in Venice, did uh, wander to the beauty of the Contessa Teresa Gracchelli, who came from Ravenna, a place that later uh, Byron was to spend some quite considerable time there. But Ravenna is famed for its late Roman and Byzantine uh, mosaics. And I think perhaps that design, that idea of building a uh, pitch's wholeness of pitches out of the fragmentary, out of the tasserai, is something that goes to the heart of the way that Barn thinks about the poetic self. Such a view of Barnett's subjectivity finds an affinity uh, with Michael O'Neill's more recent estimation that Barn's poetic thinking about identity exhibits an awareness of being engaged in composition. Barnes' poetic lines beautifully delineate and blur the boundaries of selfhood as they simultaneously assert and dissolve a certainty of poetic self. Often Byronic syntax, phrase and rhythm, as O'Neill goes on to elaborate, are equal to an astonishing and self-fashioning that disarms analysis by both fixing and celebrating the fluidity of identity. This sense of Byronic identity is attuned to Byron's own reflections about the role of the persona of the pilgrim um, in Child Howard, especially as he presents the pilgrim in Canto Four of the poem. In a letter to John Hobhouse, uh, written again from Venice, dated the 2nd of January, 1818, he uh, announces this about the pilgrim. The letter, in fact, published as a dedicatory preface to Canto Four of Child Howard. And he writes this of the distinction he wants to make. Here we are. It's on the handout too, it's quote six. With regard to the conduct of the last canto, there will be found less of the pilgrim than in any of the preceding, and that little slightly, if at all separated from the author speaking in his own person. The fact is that I had become weary of drawing a line which everyone seemed determined not to perceive. I asserted and imagined that I, I had drawn a distinction between the author and the pilgrim, and the very anxiety to preserve this difference and disappointment at finding it unavailing so far crushed my efforts in the composition that I determined to abandon it altogether and have done so. Baron found a corollary for his own predicament of selfhood in the city of Venice's splendid decay and her captivating ability to hover between those records of the historian's pen and the inspired muse of the poetic imagination, which seeks to preserve Venice as he calls it the fairy city of the heart, even as the changing times render her proud historic deeds obsolete. Venice exists as a mythical and political reality, which for Barn delights in the blurred boundaries between personal memory and public records ruin and home, nature and cultural artifice. Yet Venice, the city of Barnes' sexual promiscuity, according to Barnes himself, up to at least 200 liaisons of varying kinds, and I will not go into, 
and his creative fecundity is a place of rich promise and possibilities worthy of preserving for posterity. But it's also equally a force already spent, fallen into physical and political ruin by the time Barnett arrived there. I'll just go back one to this quotation. There we go. Published in 1818, he had a fourth child of Harold's pilgrimage. In the words of Roland Noel, a late 19th century English poet, is the grandest of all and has some of the finest descriptive poetry in our language. It opens worthily with Venice in her sad glory. Yet the Byronic narrator's description of Venice, for all the exaltation of her architecture, architectural wonders, recognizes the ambiguous strengths and shortcomings of the social structures that permit an artistic culture to flourish. Think back perhaps to the barbarism of the Colosseum, but also Rome's great uh, achievements in culture. From the first stanza of Canto IV, these amb ambiguities are evident in the impossible view of the improbable city of Venice. This is quote seven on the handout. We have a wonderful Spencerian stanza. I stood in Venice on the Bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. I saw from out the wave her structures rise as from the stroke of the enchanted wand. A thousand years their cloudy wings expand around me and dying glory smiles. All the far times when many a subject land looks to the winged land's marble piles where Venice sat in state, throned on her hundred isles. From the outset, Venice's utopian political ideals are tempered by the necessity of legal constraints, a palace, and a place, a prison, to contain those who break the rule of law. Arising from the natural action of the ocean's waves, it is as if Venice's physical and institutional structures were cast themselves as organic extensions of the sea, itself modeled by divine creator or agency. Venice, with its dying glory, exists in and outside of nature and history. Barn captures the city in a permanent state of ruinous decay, floating as an insubstantial conjuring of an enchanted wand and an idealized, if not immortalized, center of political and cultural power whose enfolding cloudy wings miraculously resist through a poetic sleight of hand being reduced to those marble piles. Venice is both within history and outside of it. She is regal, yet usurped as a presence. She is being lost, but still, at least in the Baronic imagination, preserved amidst the waves of history. She's simultaneously at one with nature, yet divided from her. And her reputation in the moment that it's being recovered through the poetic imagination of Barn is equally being forgotten. The moment of her supposed poetic recovery is also the moment of her loss. For Barn, the city's sense of its own loss and decline makes it all the more dear. And a remarkable um, stanza, very close to the one I've just read. Uh, this is one of the wonderful instances in which Byron creates a kind of magic charm circle of the imagination to ensure that Venice um, continues even in her demise. He writes this. In Venice, Tasso's echoes are no more and silent rose the songless gondolier. Her palaces are crumbling to the shore and music meets not always now the ear. Those days are gone. But beauty still is here. States form, arts fade, but nature doth not die, nor yet forget how Venice once was dear. If poetic remembering for Bron is a form of forgetting, then willful forgetting becomes an act of remembering. The speaker's assured metaphysical confidence in the continuance of nature that doth not die is only met by a plea that we, as much as nature, should not forget how Venice once was dear. Such a plea may be desperate in the face of the certain statement that such Helsin days are gone, 
but this, this assuredness is militated against by the preceding line where music meets not always now the ear. Venice and her music is not quite vanquished into the historical past, for so long as the city's music intermittently finds an ear, she persists in the here and present now of the moment. As in Barnes' evocative opening in his Ode on Venice, the eagle-eyed of you will have spotted those two quotations, eight on the handout. Think of this as 8.2. Um, this is the opening of the Ode on Venice by Brown. Oh, Venice, Venice, when thy marble walls are level with the waters. And again, you can see Barnes playing with shifts in tense between past and present and future, working very hard here, as they do in Manfred's account of the Colosseum, to preserve Venice from becoming those ruined historical marble piles overcome by the waters of time and history. Barnes' celebration of Venice, a city who has a spell beyond her name in story, bemoans the subdued wonders, riches and powers of the city, only to remember her splendors, poetically at least, for posterity, through a deliberate means of self-forgetting -forget and an evasion of the historical. I'll put that slightly differently. We might think of these moments of lyrical meditation, create a sense then of a temporality that holds change and ruination in abeyance. Equally though, such Byronic meditative moments with their associative poetic logic provide the narrative momentum of the poem that drives its form and thoughts forward, especially when those thoughts cut across stanza breaks and challenge the conventions of the spin Syrian mould that would otherwise contain them. In that sense, the poem constantly is breaking the lyrical spell it seeks to create of a temporality to remind the reader of the debilitating effects of time itself. Let's take an instance back to the Colosseum briefly, but the Colosseum as it appears in Charlton Howell, Canto 4. Barnes' reprisal of the Colosseum in Canto 4, which he tells us cannot bear the light of day, recalls Manfred's nocturnal wanderings. By momentarily glorifies the Colosseum's ruin as an eternal object of thought brought about, is quote nine on the handout, brought about by the transformative qualities of the evening Italian light. But as the lines run over the stanza break between stanzas 128 and 129, they admit into this lyric moment of meditation the presence of time, at first as a seemingly positive force, only then to adumbrate the distorting and destructive effects. Notice the words exhaust, bent and broke that start to come through um, in the language that Barn uses to describe um, the Colosseum. Her, that's Rome, of course, her Colosseum stands, the moonbeams shine as it were its natural torches, for divine should be the light which streams here to illumine this long, explored, but still exhaustless mine of contemplation and the azure gloom of an Italian night when the deep skies assume hues which have words and speak to yea heaven, floats o'er this vast and wondrous monument and shadows forth its glory, there is given unto the things of earth which time hath bent, a spirit's feeling where he hath lent his hand, but broke his scythe. So that which Brian feared in a letter dated June 1818 to Thomas More, that the Spencerian stands is running into each other in this way would be perceived as a defect of Canto IV, turns out, I think, to be one of Byron's great virtues as a poet and a formerly innovation in the way that he presents and treats poetic subjectivity and the temporal. Elsewhere, in Canto IV, Byron's reflections on memory, identity, and historical monuments are also questioned and refined the earlier Byronic model that we saw in Manfred, which equated the physical ruins of history with the existential fate of the self. This is quote 10. This is a wonderful moment in Encounter 4 where um, Barn has let his mind kind of wander across all kinds of Italian delights and geography and suddenly realizes he needs to draw his mind back to the city um, of Venice. Let my soul wanders, I demand it back to meditate amongst decay and stand a ruin amidst ruins, 
there to track fallen states and buried greatness, or a land which was the mightest in its old command, and is the loveliest and must ever be the master mould of nature's heavenly hand, wherein were cast the heroic and the free, the beautiful, the brave, the lords of earth and sea. After a moment of existential angst, the narrator's roaming soul returns from the ruins um, of Rome to the subject of a form in Venice. This withdrawal of the wandering soul from immortalized um, uh, Roman delights marks both a moment of return and an inward turn in the poetry, which is increasingly alert to the fragmentary condition of the perceiving subject. Increasingly alert to that sense of the self as being fragmented. The world beyond is fragmented and the interiorized um, self of the poem is equally um, fractured. In a literal sense, the narrator's soul returns to meditate amongst decay and contemplate the impossibility of recovering the past in its totality. One of the fascinating things about fragments and ruins is that they, they, they invite you to complete them you know, hermeneutically. They say, go on, make me complete. Tell me what I once belonged to. And at the same time, they frustrate the possibility of ever achieving that sense of completion or wholeness. The narrator's inability then to recover or track the wholeness of those fallen states and buried greatness serves as a reminder of the predicament of the fragmented observing subject to whom the past is irretrievably lost and the future utterly unknowable. Byron's image here of the master mold of Nietzsche's heavenly hand may at first suggest a godlike cast uh, in which all things are modeled in their completeness and perfection. But this poetic fiction unravels to reveal the fragmented experience of the self, itself, as Byron tells us, a ruin amidst ruins. And it frustrates this impulse towards completion and totality. More playfully, but no less darkly, Byron acknowledges in his later poem, Don Juan, these difficulties with attaining or recovering posthumous glory. He writes in that uh, mock epic of glory this, glory, it's not on the handout, forgive me, glory, tis something, nothing words, illusion, wind, depending more upon the historian's style than on the name a person leaves behind. He takes up a similar theme in his poetic epistle to John Murray. And he writes uh, concerning Beppo, a poem he composed in Venice in 1817, um, this, perhaps some such pen is still extant in Venice. Let's change that slide to Canaletto, there we are. He hints with that phrase, perhaps uh, some such pen is still extant in Venice, that poetic preservation of Venice as a historical and unhistorical phenomenon is partly an exercise in psychodrama and is it's a bid to perpetuate the existence of his own poetic self, name and pen as much as it is to perpetuate the state of Venice. This Byronic preoccupation recalls an early entreaty from the narrator in Turianthi, which requests that the reader's own name with this my verse be entwined so that our kinder eyes a look shall cast on Harold's page. So Baron is deliberately inextricably binding together imaginative poetic composition with the writing of history. And it permits a kind of mobility of selfhood, which cuts across traverses between the public and private self. Um, public and private spill over into one another, just as those Spencerian stanzas haze the boundaries between their poetic um, shapes. And it blurs, I think, um, for our stand, that distinction between what we might think of as historical record and poetic fiction. A really famous instance of this occurs in, in Beppo. Beppo is written in Ottava Rima, uh, and where we witness uh, satirical procrastination on the part of the narrator, take a, a more blackly serious tone, and he dissolves um, in this digression the Venice of the literary imagination and mythology with the actuality of Venice's immediate presence. Before turning to the supposed substance of his story, and it takes a long time to get to the story of Beppo, 
Um, in some ways, the point of Befo is, is not the story that's being told, but the actual performing um, self-conscious, digressive consciousness that narrates it. Um, the narrator unexpectedly breaks off to describe to his audience in painstaking detail the appearance, function, and motion of a Venetian gondola. This is quote nine um, on the handout. Did you ever see a gondola? For fear you should not, I'll describe it to you exactly. Tis long covered boat that's common here, carved up the prow, but lightly, but compactly, rowed by two rowers, each called gondolier. It glides along the water looking blackly, just like a coffin clapped in a canoe, where none can make out what you say or do. And up and down the long canals they go, and under the rail to shoot along, by night and day, all paces swift or slow, and round the theatres, a sable throng, they wait in their dusk livery of woe, but not to them do woeful things belong, for sometimes they can take a deal of fun, like morning coaches when the funeral's done. Hmm. Well, but I'm certain you about um, sexual liaisons in Venice, and one may, as many critics have, uh, given that a historical biographical background, detected a certain sexual frisson, shall we say here, uh, and perhaps sexual tension and release. I I'll not dwell too much on that, but I, I think um, I don't need to be too Freudian to, to just point to the fact he's talking about the pun on fun and the word fun in funeral, um, the ways in which the implied strokes, the two rowers, uh, the gliding motion, the gondolas that shoot uh, along under the Rialto. Yeah, but I think we need not say more of that. But I do want to suggest that such strokes suggest something else. These darkly graceful gliding to and fro movements of the gondolas, driven by strokes of all paces, swift and slow, may also, as they weave their way to the Grand Canal and its tributaries, put us in mind of the motion of the pen of the poet or historian on the blank page. There's a self-awareness of the motion and process of writing that is evident in Byron's performative, yet casual and arbitrary performance of narrating consciousness in Beppo. And it's really marked by the, um, the, the end of the poem, which I've included just on this slide, the last quotation on the slide there, um, where he suddenly ends with this wonderfully arbitrary declarative flourish and says, the story ends of Beppo because, as we're told as readers, my pen is at the bottom of a page. Finito. Done. Such stagey declarative flourishes serve as a rehearsal for the finale of Canto IV of Charlie Howell's Pilgrimage. By the close of the fourth canto, we have a sense, at least for now, that self, memory, and hope have been exhausted. And that, as Baron uh, goes on to tell us, my theme has died into an echo. Might put us, of course, in mind of the echo of Tesso's song, of course, amongst the gondoliers um, of Venice. He goes on to write, and this is in quote 12, stands at 185, count of four. It is fit the spell should break of this protracted dream the torch shall be extinguished, which has lit my midnight lamp. And what is writ is writ. Would it were worthier, but I am not now that which I have been. And my visions flit less palpably before me. And the glow which in my spirit dwelt is fluttering faint and low. Here, Brown again breaks his own charm circle of imagination. He returns us to a midnight scene that recalls both in set setting and imagery, but Manfred's opening remark in, his, in that lyrical drama of 1816, where he says, the lamp must be replenished, but even then it will not burn so long as I must watch. Whereas Manfred's lamp uh, will be refueled to light his nocturnal visual of enduring thought, the midnight lamp of Charles the Howald will be extinguished as Byron's spirit burns fluttering faint and low. This revised um, image of the midnight lamp, which unlike the poetic self that burns low, is actively expunged in the poem, indicates Byron's exhaustion with the poetic model of brooding inexplicable suffering he's adopted in Manfred and the latter two cantos of Charles the Howald's pilgrimage. 
time Barn is indicating for a change in poetic mode. As Barn then here illuminates the scene of writing, he obliterates and extinguishes the point, its point of origin, rather theatrically, gesturing towards the need for a new poetic model in the form, say, that of Beppo or the mock epic Don Juan. Given the previous allegiance of personal and historical circumstances, this new poetic experimentation deflects his readers into the life outside of poetic fiction and the, as of yet, unspoken, at least not openly spoken, uh, origins of his suffering, of his fears and anxieties about the Augusta Lee affair um, and the damage this might do to his poetic reputation. Imploring readers to remember and returning them to the world beyond the protracted dream, Barnes' final stanza self-consciously delights in its own theatrical fictions and rehearses some of those latest strategies of deflection and deferral so often incorporated into the fabric and poetic texture of Don Juan. Here we have the next um, stanza. A sound, well, 13, hand up. A sound which makes us linger, yet farewell. Yea, who have traced the pilgrim to the scene which is his last, if in memories dwell a thought which once was his, if on ye swell a single recollection, not in vain he wore his sandal shoon and scallop shell. Farewell with him alone may rest the pain, if such there were with you the moral of his strain. In this valediction, Barn glimpses the poetic impulses that drive on Juran as he delights in multiple possibilities, simultaneously opening up and suspending interpretive choices, deferring moral and aesthetic judgments to a future reader outside of his poetic creations. Here, the twice repeated condition of if in memories dwell a thought which once was his, and if on ye swell a single recollection, tentatively hopes that something of this final and all other previous scenes uh, which have impinged upon the narrator's subjectivity will also have left a lasting memorable impression on the mind of the reader. Yet the further treble repetition of if in the last line makes that hopeful assertion even less certain and even more vulnerable to the reader's interpretive choices, uh, which might interpret a very different moral from Barnes' strain about the pilgrim's suffering and pain with recourse to history and biography. As Peter Manning incisively notes, Barnes' inquiry into history, monuments too for that matter, ruins, is an extension of inquiry into self. For all of Barnes' imaginative immersion in his own and the subject subjectivity of others, he remains sympathetic yet wary of what Keats defines as a negatively capable poetic. The last two quotations on the handout are from Keats. Keats famously talks about the way that subjectivity um, is about being uh, in a state of negative capableness, which is to be in the state of mysteries, doubts, and uncertainties without any irritable reaching after fact and reason that for Keats, the practical character has no self. Barnes attracted to that idea, but he's also cautious and wary of it. We'll return just that moment that I read from um, the earlier account of when he calls his soul back. Barnes writes earlier then, that my soul wanders to meditate among decay and stand a ruin amidst ruin. Here he realizes another one of these self-consciously staged moments, which objectively seek to rein in an endless me meandering mobility of selfhood and subjectively borders on a sol solipsistic collapse into a fracturing and fractured self. This splintered yet unified, perhaps what we might call mosaical Byronic self is as much absorbed in as it is reflective of all the myriad goings on of life. As he puts it in Canto three, even as a broken mirror, which the glass and every fragment multiplies and makes a thousand images as of one that was. This moment, like many others in Canto three and four, encapsulates the perspectival, the contradictory, self-conscious poetic performance of selfhood, the shifting subjectivities that are vital to both the dynamism and also the dread of Barnes mobility of poetic selfhood. It is a poetic subjectivity that fears and embraces madness, delights in the solidity and the liquidity, 
liquidity of selfhood and finds itself attendant at both the ashes of its own destructive flame and phoenix-like rebirth. Such a Byronic poetic self finds itself at one with Hamlet, who, as the Prince of Denmark remarks, of suicide often, I thought, and rests form from the floating wreck of Venice, which ruin leaves behind. Byron's mercurial poetic selfhood revels in known and unknown modes of being and time, perpetually destroying and reconstituting itself. As such, then, Venice's self-preserving and self-destructive myth holds an abiding fascination for the Byronic imagination. It is a city of shadowy brilliance that exists within and outside the temporal and historical. It exists as a substantial and insubstantial form created mysteriously from the Adriatic's ebb and flow. The charmed spell of an eternal Venice is both preserved, forever suspended and undone through Barnes self-conscious laying bare of the fictive and perspectival nature of personal memory and public history. For Barn, Venice is an impossible architectural city of imaginative possibilities, whose spell beyond her name is both a perpetual enchantment and a forgotten incantation. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, in a sort of Byronic um, um, exhibition of Byronic mobility of selfhood, I'm going to moderate my own questions. <laughs> so uh, I'm open to attempt to answer any questions anyone may, may have, preferably about Barn, of course, but you know, I'm open to other things too. Jennifer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right. It could be a whole section on water and the and and, 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 the, and the ocean. Absolutely, I mean, and partly because I, th I think water. Um, interestingly, when we think about it as an emblem of time, um, it suggests eternity um, and and the transcendental uh, and something that will last forever. But it's also, of course, in its actions and its motions, a source of transience and erosion and change. So, so water is a great poetic emblem because it, because it encapsulates both those things. And, and in certain Child of Harold, at least, um, Barn has a sort of real struggle in Canto 3. He's having all sorts of trouble with the ocean because uh, he feels himself like flotsam and jetsam, like a weed being flung around by it. And he has no sense of being able to control his fate or his destiny. But the stanzas before the lines that I quoted that kind of bring um, kind of water to a close is back to the ocean. And he talks about the way in which he, he now, there's a little bit more sexual freeze on there, I think. He, he talks about the way in which he gives himself willingly to the wanton breakers um, of the waves. And he talks about images to see her as female and riding her as if it were a mare. But more important is that wonderful oxymoronic phrase he has that he's willing to give himself over to what he calls a pleasing fear. Um, so it's almost as if he's kind of reconciled himself to the waters, both of the ocean, but of, of time and of history too. Um, a lot more, I think, could be said about water, but it's a really important emblem um, that runs through. And initially, uh, you feel as if he's just sort of being, you know, the flotsam and jo he's just the flotsam and jetsam of life with no control. By the end of it, he seems to have quietly mastered it or allowed himself to be mastered by it. Maybe, maybe both things are true with my sort of sense of the poetic ironic for it itself. Yeah, no, but absolutely a lot more to be done about water.
Hello. Hi. That was uh, well taken the image of the mirror. Yeah. And it being shattered and then each piece. Yeah, yeah. I, and again, what's I think in terms of the image of the kaleidoscope that that um, that I quoted earlier on, and also with the mosaic, I think as well. You know, having the tesser and I that make up. Um, uh, and there's some wonderful moments. Um, stanza 15 of Canto 4. He's talking about the the glass statues that are shivered, and he means that they've been broken into splinters. But I think it's a wonderful. I think he puts it because shivered also gives them the kind of humanity that they are shivering because they obviously. Venice's um, big sack, as it were, is, 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 is its cultural um, icons are being attacked. Um, and, and that sense that, that, that there's a humanity to it. And, and that whole stanza, that one stanza, ha, has a wonderful sense of rhyme about rust and dust and must. And in that, I think there's a bit of the sense of the word musty from the must, which gives a kind of definiteness to it. And it's one of those examples of what I call the kind of magic circle of kind of Byron's imagination where he, he's suggesting all the elements of decay and ruination, but he's also just holding them off in events, you know, like the music, you know, meets not always now, yeah, but, but sometimes it might still just remain. So I, I think that's there too. Um, I think that's why he's fascinated by, I mean, Byron has an odd relationship with Keats. I mean, I should make that clear. Can I say what he says about Keats? Probably, probably not, it's not very polite. Um, do you know that he says that Keats wrote piss -bed poetry? Uh, he, he, uh, he comes to have a better view of Keats. I think by the time he's writing Don Juan, he's read Hyperion, and he, he warms to Keats's um, uh, Hyperion, his, uh, Keats's attempt to write an epic. Um, but I, I, I think he, he's attracted by the idea of negative capability, that kind of multiple, that sense that you can inhabit many other kinds of entities, as well as being returning to oneself. Um, but I think he's also a little cautious about it. I mean, and it may be, have something to do with his changing attitudes um, towards Keats's poetry um, itself. But no, I, 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 it's an image that comes up, as I say, quite a lot. And the one I really love is, well, I wish I didn't quote, the one of Canto, Canto 4, stanza 15, about, about, about statues. Um, and that's shivering. That's just such a great word and resonates in, in the, the, that very practical, splintered, fractured way, but also that this sort of sheer humanizes um, the pain of what's going on for them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, several. Uh, I'll go for, I think at the back was first, and then Josh. Um. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you, you sort of, I suppose you sort of think that Bam wants to have his cake and eat it at the same time. And, but I think there's an element of that because, I mean, um, you know, be, because Venice is in this, in this sadder, ruinous, decay state as, as he sees it. But of course, I mean, politically, historically, Venice, the Republic, you know, it was a shining example of what a Republic should be. Um, to, to sort of see it fall under the kind of tyrant yoke as he sees it. Um, so I think it's also trying to preserve not just, um, not just the kind of artifacts and the architecture of Venice, but also the ideal of what she stood for. But even within that, I mean, as you, uh, as you saw from that opening stanza of Canto IV, Vaughan's acutely aware that, um, that, that even trying to realize those utopian ideals, aspirations in any way, you have to be practical about it and you have to have rules and law and a palace and a prison to put those people that are not always going to obey those rules and laws. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it ties in, I think, too, with the idea that Brian is both seeing, he's very inward and introspective in his poetic selfhood, but he also has that, has that wonderful quote from Nietzsche, isn't it, that comes to mind. Nietzsche talks about the way that um, the fairy tale creature can turn its eyes upon itself and look at itself as if it were kind of from the outside. And I think that's what I mean by the kind of subjective and the objectified. And even when he's talking about sort of perhaps being on the, the borders of madness, he, he's, he, he's thinking both, yeah, I might be going, you know, mad here. On the other hand, he's stepping away and thinking about that self 
and saying, hmm, that self looks like it might be going a bit mad. So there's a, you know, he's keeping a kind of judgment there. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, I think conservative with a small C, uh, and, but also partly to try to preserve what was good about the liberal ideal of Venice itself. Thanks, Josh, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Yes. Yeah, the way that the stanzas are hazing into one another could be like the yeah. So it's kind of the erosion of the stanza egg form as the sea would. Yeah. Yeah. Whilst it's also preserving. Yeah. Sorry, Josh, you've got more to say. Go on. Yeah. 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 Oh, I should have. I should have done that, shouldn't I? Because that would fit very nicely with the strokes of the gondolas in. In yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think there is an element of that. I, th I think you know it's just that perhaps there is an element of, of sort of realizing that you, you have control over so much over the form and, and how you might, and, and in a way, perhaps going back to Manfred and the Colosseum, I mean, I like to think of that as a kind of, it, it's a kind of strong reading, shall we say, of the Colosseum, and, and Manfred's offering us that strong reading of the Colosseum, where it's softened down, it, it, the whole austerity is softened down by the moonlight, because he's thinking not only about how the Colosseum is going to be remembered, but how is he going to be remembered? So he's sort of trying to give us a kind of model, if you like, for how we might offer a strong reading of Manfred, and behind that, possibly, even Barn himself, let's forget the, let, let's forget the indiscretions, the delinquencies, let's remember, you know, um, so I think there's that there too, but I think by the end of Cantor, he's sort of beginning to realise that those sort of models aren't going to work, and that he's not going to have that kind of um, power over the reader. Um, he's very often entreating the readers being kind or trying to get the reader on side. And then at other moments, you know, there are great moments in Bethel where he goes on about um, you know, how to go, and literally goes on, I mean that, goes on about how tedious digressions are whilst digressing um, and, and how frustrating they are to the reader. But he carries on doing it. You know? um, so, yes, I think that's, yeah, I, I, I like that point. I, I should steal it from. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Josh. That was a good point. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Is it Moi um, uh, Is that the one that's closest to Venice and Calvino? Or am I misremembering the name? Yeah. 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 So I'm wondering if this was typical. It's interesting, isn't it? And my memory is, I'd have to double check this, that actually in Charlotte Howard IV, Barnes slips a bit between whether he thinks of the city as being female or indeed male. Um, and, uh, and it's part, I mean, I suppose with Venice, it's a little bit more sense because of the, 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 the ritual of the Day of Ascension and the betrothal, you know, the, the those are going out on the Pacento, throwing the ring into the Adriatic, and that sense of the city being married to the sea, I was back to water, Jennifer, so you know, being married to, to the Adriatic. So, but he does, on occasions, I think, in Channel 4, suggest that the, the reverse that um, gender um, association of the city as well. But in his letters, as far as I can see, he seems to be, I'm almost tempted to say, perhaps it's just more conventional, isn't it, to think of cities 
Actually, we are going to a trip, we can give them this note, don't we? I don't know why that is, right? I'm not sure it is. Um, but with Venice in particular, I think the whole, that whole ritual, um, uh, that sense of her being married to the sea perhaps underlines, reinforces that sense of the city's being um, female. Yeah, yeah. But I think there was a little bit, if you look in Cantor, I think there's a little bit of slippage sometimes in the way that Bond um, does gender um, Venice. Thanks. Uh, Carl? Yes, and Carl's got his hand up, which I guess means there's a. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, good. Oh, bless them. Yeah, I suppose you could see them that way. Um, uh, I, I suppose the only thing I would say is that if we keep to the kind of, um, I want to call them venels. Venels is what we have in, in, in Durham. In, 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 we have these little narrow um, cart throughs that can you have know, shortcuts between the streets. Um, uh, and I think many of them was venels. That's called venels. I'm sure there's a proper Venetian word for the, the, those little um, lanes that run between the palazzas. Oh, Palazzi. Um, but I think I'd like that idea so long as we can have the moment that when you burst into, into a square, you suddenly have that explosion of light and revelation and illumination as well. That the digressions do get you somewhere, the brown in the end. Yeah, they are revelatory in some way. Um, um, and I think that's part of the theatricality, the, the performativity of self that Brown's interested in. So, yes, so long as we can have revelations at the end. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandy. It was worth the two year wait that it took to get you here. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon, and I hope that you will join us downstairs for a reception in the Cox Reception Hall where you can talk more with Dr. Sandy and continue the conversation. Um, I also hope that you will consider um, attending the Baylor Chamber Singers Spring Concert titled A Browning Music Concert, which will be held here in the ABL's Foyer of Meditation on April 25th and will feature music for choir and solo singers composed of texts by Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So I hope that we'll see you there. And for students who are needing CAE credit, you can check out in the, the main lobby on your way out. Thank you all for being here this afternoon.